This is Twit. I'd love to pick up on the thread about dystopian futures. And just, just as a sort of reminder that we tend to go throughout history, uh, that the pendulum swings um, and rarely does it fall in the center where we just have, where we're, we're satisfied with pragmatism. Um, so in a sense, it's not strange to me that we've spent so long telling each other stories about utter, you know, horror stories, zomb- zombie apocalypses, um, you know, the, the dystopia somehow is getting darker and darker. I've been watching The Boys second season oh, and I'm not going to spoil oh. well you know I got through that whatever second episode and it was I, I remember I did like, not get through this kind of a strange name for <laughs> yeah. a, a feminist yeah, character right. but you know <laughs> anyhow uh so I was momentarily going to bed that night feeling like somewhat vindicated and then obviously th- things take a real wow. turn um here, here's the point though I think we arrived in in this place, not just in the stories that we tell, but the actual real world problems that we have, because it began with, um, y- you know, a total u- utopian outlook, a utopian thinking. The, certainly the Internet and technology. We really thought this was going to make the world a better place. That's right. And the problem with, uh, I think, anchoring ourselves in optimism or utopia uh, is that we then fail to recognize that there are negative, there can be also negative next order impacts when either you're not planning for real world issues, real world problems that could result, um, or or you think that somehow everything will be okay. And I, I don't mean the sort of Norman Vincent Peale uh, power of positive thinking, but I do think back to Wells um, and at the turn of the century, you know, a lot of those early, very, very, very early science fiction writers were writing about utopia. Um, they were writing about science and evidence-based utopia where everything would be amazing. And part of why everything was so amazing was because of eugenics. Right? Yeah. So, Whoops. Um, so so, I, I agree that maybe we don't need to continue. We need a better balance. But my concern is I, I watch us sort of go back and forth and people who are writing about science and and they're writing sci-fi or they're working in futures in, in, in the area of futures, it seems to be zero sum. Um, and if mm. we swing totally in the other direction, I think we wind up uh, to some extent um, 20 years from now back at where we started. Yeah. I, I, I have a complicated relationship with uh, technological utopianism because it's um, – it's it's a criticism that's often leveled at the sort of what you might call the digital rights community that that you know back in the old days we thought if we could just connect everybody it would be fine and then we failed to understand that it would end up like it did and i do think that the digital rights community made some missteps but i don't think that they were in failing to understand the potential risks of technology right remember that organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Free Software Foundation have their grounding not merely in aspirations for the kinds of self-realization and self-actualization and community that we could get with technology, but also in fear for what it would mean to have uh, a technological society without them, right? What it would mean to have ubiquitous networks but no cryptography so that universal surveillance would become a, a, a kind of commonplace of the future that is what animates those movements. And if you think that the future will take care of itself, the technology is going to is going to sort out all the problems. You don't start an organization like Electronic Frontier Foundation. You just, you know, go off and start up do a startup or something because it's all going to take care of itself. It, it, it's, you know, the this idea that Michael Weinberger had when he wrote this paper for public knowledge on 3D printing, which is uh, it will all be so great if we don't screw it up. I, I really feel like that's the animating uh, ideology of, of at least the digital rights world. But I do think that we did get one thing wrong, which is that we failed to understand that um, we had passed the heroic age of anti-monopoly enforcement. Uh, and we didn't understand exactly what that would mean. After all, if you got your first computer around the time of the IBM PC, you were enjoying a computer ecosystem in which the largest tech company in the history of the world was too frightened to bundle its own operating system with its flagship computer because it might attract antitrust attention. They had just gone through a 12-year antitrust enforcement action in which they had outspent the entire DOJ's budget for antitrust 
for all DOJ cases in that one case every year IBM spent that much and and which IBM had exercised forbearance when when Tom Jennings the uh, brilliant computer engineer who also started Fidonet uh, reverse engineered the ROM in the PC for Phoenix computers so that they could sell it to Dell and Gateway and all those other companies to make their own computers. And we, I think if you grew up with computers in that era, you you quite naturally might have assumed that if a company became a monopolist that prevented the kind of dynamic turnover that was common in an era where one day AltaVista was on top and the next day was Yahoo, and the next day was Google, that that the DOJ might exercise some uh, some some enforcement against them. And instead, you know, after Microsoft petered out, I still think the Microsoft case did some good, but after Microsoft petered out, that was it. We just let companies do the most nakedly anti-competitive stuff, you know, buy their competitors, merge with major competitors, create vertical monopolies, and end up in a world where, you know, the web is five giant websites filled with screenshots from the other four, and surveillance is ubiquitous, not least because states rely on private companies to gather the data that they then plunder for state surveillance. And so there, there's, you know, no hope of states... Uh, curbing the surveillance impulse of tech companies for so long as they're a prime beneficiary of it. Corey, I totally agree with you. However, um, when I hear the same argument being made, it is with reference to the current uh, investigations, at least the ones being levied in the United States, where the calls tend to be, let's break up these companies. The challenge, mm-hmm. of course, is that, again, our the, the, the mechanisms that we have for regulation were developed in a time when company structures were different and the IP that companies were producing weren't so deeply embedded into all of the rest of their operations. You know, the United mm-hmm. States, as, as a lot of company or countries, you know, the U.S. doesn't have its own cloud. Um, the, the federal government runs on AWS. Um, the United States has stopped heavily investing in R&D and quite frankly, not just within tech, but in science as well, every carry, everybody carries mu- uh, everybody cares much, much more about the D than the R. Um, so with basic w- with funding for basic science and research being stripped, the question that we have to ask ourselves is if we don't want these monopolies, which I think everybody at this point generally agrees that we do not, because today we're talking about tech, tomorrow it will be the frontiers of synthetic biology and other types of um, other types of technologies. You know, the question is, how do we keep the research moving forward when we've essentially outsourced it uh, to the private sector and engineer the future so that it looks different? And I think the problem is that we don't have the right, we're not engaged in the right conversations. So it can't be as simple as um, we've we screwed up over the past 40 years. The way we're going to fix it is that the way we fixed it before, which is through the traditional antitrust uh, and anti-competitiveness um, regulatory frameworks, because I, I just don't think they're going to, I think what's going to happen is we're going to wind up in court for a whole bunch of years. And I don't know that we will have solved the problems waiting for us on the other side of the horizon. 